Alrighty, hello every folks and good morning. Welcome to another uh, Tactics Ogre run. So here's the thing. Uh, recently there were a couple of runs that I was doing. I, I say recently, but uh, back when I was uh, first streaming the uh, the Nothing Burger run, there was a challenge that was thrown out there that I kind of thought was a was a funny joke at the time. I didn't really think much of it. But uh, since then, uh, you know, the Nothing Burger challenge kind of just ended up uh, quietly, uh, well, going dark for a little bit there because I didn't have a Switch for the longest time and that's where that save file was. Um, there was uh, there was the uh, the ranged only challenge that started a few months ago and basically just turned out to be playing normally, but it's a little bit slower now. And so long story short, I wanted to actually take a suggestion from a couple of years ago. Uh, there was uh, one of the first uh, kind of joke suggestions that somebody threw out there when Reborn first came out that seemed like it was a bit of a funny thing to go into as a kind of way to, uh, to bring back both of those runs in a more interesting manner. Because uh, as I put put in a community post earlier today. Frankly, my issue with those ones is just that they were kind of just going slowly. Like, it, it was just playing the game normally, but slower. There wasn't really a whole lot of interesting trickery to them. And that's what makes these runs fun. So, with that being said, let's talk about the No Walking Challenge. <laughs> now, on paper, this might seem, you know, it might seem a little bit uh, a little bit obvious. Like, hey, you know, I, I played the PSP version, all you gotta do is sit there and wait for them to come to you. But this is not the PSP version. <laughs> so in Reborn, just like the SNES version, uh, the AI actually tries to keep itself alive to some description. So essentially what ends up happening here is that uh, they will actually actively avoid uh, getting into a fight with their important characters if they can help so uh, most of the time. By the way, a little bit of a side note here, part of the reason that I actually even considered doing this challenge at this point is just due to the fact that I can do this whole clip recording method off of the Switch Lite. Um, basically, the running theme of this particular challenge is just that it is unbelievably tedious, but like, the fun kind of tedious to the point where you don't mind doing it on your own, uh, but if you were to put it on a stream, you would just kind of feel bad for the crime that you're doing against humanity at that moment. So this basically meant that I could go record the interesting parts uh, over on the uh, over on the Switch there, and for, you know, all the in-between, hey, we're just going to re-roll for that knockback chance 80 billion times, um, you know, we can go ahead and just automatically cut that part out by not recording it in the first place. It's convenient. Uh, for a game as long as Tactics Ogre, you gotta think about these things a bit more than usual. <laughs> so anyways, let's get into it here. Um, actually, quick yet another step backwards here. That's the reason you're going to see that 1995-2022 Square Enix thing on at all times, because apparently um, one of the oddly specific things that they brought back was the screenshot feature uh, from the PSP version. However, in this case, it's just att just attached to all the videos for some reason. Um, when the screenshot function was used in the PSP version, like, you know, they're like, here's this picture, here's our copyright, all that kind of thing. Um, and it was useful for uh, for doing kind of still shot runs. I actually did a few of those back in the day. Um, and it's super weird to see that they specifically went out of their way to take the screenshot function's uh, little uh, watermark there and attach it to the Switch video function. <laughs> um, anyway, let, let's go ahead and get into it here. So the thing with a no movement challenge, it sounds again like on paper you'd mostly just doing a lot, do uh, a lot of sitting still and waiting for the enemy to come to you. But the thing is, they don't come to you in a lot of cases. Uh, as I mentioned before, the important characters typically stay behind. And additionally, uh, this also means that uh, there's no uh, getting buff cards, there's no getting stat cards. In a lot of cases, there's not even getting any loot. And my intention, if it is at all possible, is to actually clear the entire game plus post-game doing it this way. Um, hopefully we'll have enough time to make that happen. So, the first thing I was doing uh, was uh, was fairly obvious here. I was going for uh, for debuff setups, figuring, you know what, long-range debuffs, that seems like a really obvious answer here. We charm some enemy units, we have them fight amongst each other, uh, we poison everybody else, and we just wait. But the thing is, range is not exactly as forgiving as it is in the other versions here. Uh, your spells typically come uh, in uh, shorter range by default, but will show up with longer range uh, as time goes on uh, with, uh, with things like extend and their staff bonuses and uh, things like that. So while you could, for example, just go pick up uh, Poison Cloud and have like a 9 or 10 or whatever the hell uh, tile range uh, as it was back in the PSP version, in this case uh, you would have to build up to that over time. So our debuffs are not only not necessarily terribly accurate right now, their range is not doing us any favors. Uh, the, uh, the initial tutorial fight just basically involved a bunch of sitting still, nothing too crazy there, but it was going to be Chrysero where things would end up staying for about the next 10 hours. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is why I'm so glad for the clip function. <laughs> um, so, again, this is in a fun way. I love these kinds of super tedious challenges. I just feel bad making videos from them. <laughs> so, first and foremost, uh, it was clear from the uh, from that initial one that uh, we would need to have shields on everybody. See, while we can't use the movement command uh, under any circumstances, we can still knock our own units around. And this leads to a lot of very interesting tech in order to uh, to reach certain characters. Um, and there's a lot of considerations that you wouldn't normally think about, like, for example, the fact that uh, shield and shortbow, while it is not necessarily that powerful, is really, really handy in terms of moving units around. Additionally, there's a lot of uh, one-tile uh, gaps that are going to be available throughout the map in a lot of situations uh, that we simply would end up getting softlocked uh, upon approaching. So, for example, uh, if I were to take a Rune Fencer, um, normally any other character wouldn't be able to walk in the water at this point, but uh, something like a Rune Fencer is innately aquatic, which means that they can be uh, moved across water tiles, but they wouldn't be able to get back on land under normal circumstances. And this also means that later on we'll actually have a, a, an actual functional use for Water Walk, believe it or not, uh, where uh, b using things like Hover and Water Walk actually does allow you to, uh, to go up one additional tile, or, for example, it allows you to to rise up out of the water. <laughs> so, very oddly specific, but I'm really looking forward to actually employing that in the run. Now, uh, when it came to actually doing damage to stuff, obviously this is still chapter one, these guys are absolute chumps, and there's not very much to worry about. So, at first I was just sending in the team as normal, as a bit of a tester run. Um, so, first thing that we we're noticing, that entire uh, line of units on the right side, they are now basically useless, um, especially Denim, um, because he has been moved into a position where his only option of actually proceeding uh, into the fight itself is down that little uh, little stair ramp over there and potentially getting thrown across to the other side in one straight line. Now, this is all well and good, except this is the moment where I forgot that I switched him over to a Rune Fencer for the purpose of uh, having a bit more versatility. That'll end up biting him in a uh, little bit from now. See, those are the kinds of fun logistical considerations we are going to be paying attention to quite a bit, because we can kill everything else on the map, we can't actually breach the, uh, the Necromancer on the other side. <laughs> so, first thing that came up is, uh, okay, the Cleric has absolutely no reason to have a staff, nor do those, uh, do those wizards, so we're going to have to replace those at some point later. Which is probably fine, because they're not really getting any bonus from the heavy staffs anyway, but still, it is what it is. Now, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, the, the Sybil Staff is basically the most worthless piece of equipment in the game, bar none. Any darn ways. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, they're stuck doing a bunch of uh, buffs to each other, or doing a bunch of buffs on themselves. It's not really going to help, like, under any circumstances here, for very obvious reasons. Because they can't move. <laughs> like, they can't move each other. I needed to put them in more of a line. Really should have taken more consideration into that particular aspect. Um, for some reason, I was convinced at this point uh, that we would be able to uh, to get Moldova to, uh, to actually go towards our direction here. Unfortunately, it just wasn't really happening. Um... Uh, she, it, back in uh, in PSP and One Vision and all that, she would essentially charge forward after the rest of her people had died. Um, at this point, she's just going to hang out back there. However, uh, the uh, the old uh, knockback thing is still inbuilt uh, in a lot of our characters. Uh, the thing is, it depends on what's doing the hitting. For some reason, basic staves do not have the ability to knock back, but most other attacks do have a very limited chance to knock backwards. I'm assuming about the staff. We'll actually circle back to cudgels later to see if they do, in fact, have a knockback chance. I think it might be zero, but again, I'm not sure. Um, in testing it a couple hundred times on this particular map, I never saw a single knockback from the Sybil staff, but again, maybe. Maybe down the road. Also, dang it. Ah, the chickens are getting riled up. I talked a bit too loud. Ah, the chickens say hi. I apologize. I think we finally have the chicken coop situation figured out, but... Actually, getting it situated requires a day where it's not raining cats and dogs outside, so that'll be when it happens. As soon as it dries out out there, I can finally, you know, then we don't have chirps in the background anymore. Okay, so, at this point, it became very clear that uh, we were not getting ahead here. Uh, but as you can tell, 
the uh, the knockback chance was again not zero on a lot of attacks. And in fact, when it comes to throwing rocks, I was actually convinced for the longest time that throwing lock uh, throwing rocks lost their ability to knock back and reborn. But I think it's actually closer to like five percent or something rather than whatever your uh, uh, knockback skill was uh, or you know their crit thing is because they don't seem to be able to naturally crit, uh, but they do seem to uh, uh, they do seem to be able to uh, to do a knockback. So that's very useful for the purposes of this challenge, uh, meaning that uh, we don't necessarily need a short bow at all times, though we can have a throwing rock on a lot of melee units in order to push somebody around. However, we will still extensively be using archers, and that's actually the main thing. Like, when I was considering a ranged-only challenge, I was considering combining these back when I was originally starting ranged-only. Um, but then, yeah, it just sort of started as its own thing. Um, but uh, when it comes to, uh, to actually moving stuff around, nothing is going to be as consistent as the archer, no questions asked. Uh, we have a very hard time actually getting a hold of any crit odds whatsoever, and the only ways that we'll effectively be able to, uh, to actually near-guarantee our crits will be to get access to the princess down the line. Um, obviously, that is not exactly going to be a very useful trick in Chapter 1. So, uh, for the time being... Uh, for the time being, I figured, okay, we're just going to keep throwing rocks in situations like this, you know, maybe attempting to gently nudge him in the right direction, and then when we know for sure that uh, we uh, want to move a unit, we just go ahead and use our long-range hand in the form of the archer, uh, uh, pushing a unit backwards one tile. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, uh, this is a pretty dumb approach, because why don't you immediately start off with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, archer here, or why don't you go for the longbow? So the longbow isn't actually available as of yet. Uh, we only have short bows at the very start, and additionally, when it comes to our actual uh, abilities to uh, uh, to move things around us here, um, uh, the only movement ability uh, that we can actually make use of right now uh, that is properly effective would be a tremendous shot. Uh, that's always going to guarantee a knockback, and additionally, uh, uh, being combined with a short bow uh, means that uh, if we use it against a heavy enough armor target, we should be able to move them back more or less gently. Uh, there will be there will be a lot of situations where we'll intentionally be taking an elemental disadvantage with a uh, long range bow in order to nudge somebody at extremely long range. Now, obviously, I screwed this one up. I was trying to figure out how to get any of these units <laughs> to move whatsoever, so I'm just awkwardly uh, uh, moving everybody around. Uh, if you're wondering why I'm occasionally taking uh, damaging spells as opposed to the throwing rock, the spells do seem to have a higher knockback chance uh, than the throwing rocks do. Um, again, if I were to guess, I would say the spells have like 15, 20-ish percent, uh, the throwing rocks feel like a 5, uh, the cudgel feels like a 0, but I'm not 100% confident in that, uh, melee weapons, again, feel like a, you know, 20, 30% chance, something like that, to, uh, to knock backwards, and obviously a guaranteed crit is a guaranteed crit. So, um... I don't know why I was trying to, uh, oh, oh yeah, right, I was trying to move Denim forward here so that I could hopefully get him up to the edge and hopefully have him take two more shots at Canopus in order to maybe shove him down. I really should have remembered that that uh, wall down there blocks that shot, but at the time I didn't, so, you know, it happens. So this one was effectively stuck. I couldn't move them anywhere, they weren't moving forward, I didn't have any more AI units to uh, go throw around. Um, I am allowing AI units uh, for, for the purpose of this one here. Just because uh, in the uh, in kind of early stages of the game, around chapter one or so, there really are not too many um, kind of uh, weird, tricky things uh, to go pull out of absolutely nowhere in order to uh, to make these a bit more consistent. Um, we would still, for example, be able to eventually uh, get these guys forward, eventually get Canopus up far enough uh, to be able to win the fight by himself. But frankly, it is more fun and just technically a little bit faster uh, to allow the AI units to do their thing. They're usually... Like, they're usually not hardy enough to win the fight by themselves anyway. So, eventually, I ended up reloading it after accepting that that one was basically a wash and starting again! So, this time around, I went, uh, went over to see what else uh, we had available at this point in case I was missing something. Um, and ended up going for more archers and ended up uh, going for more uh, Valks. So... Those are going to be essential tools in the long run here. So archers in particular are the only ones that are going to be able to guarantee that long-range push. Um, we will eventually probably use more uh, kind of a splash casters in order to be able to, uh, to push units in particular directions. But when it comes to a guaranteed you are getting pushed exactly that way type situation, nothing's ever going to top the archer for this. 
So, and it's it's one of the things that uh, they're really useful for in speedruns as well. Um, again, oddly specific, but very useful. So, in this particular instance, what I was going for is uh, that I wanted to get the Knight and Canopus uh, kind of getting pushed forward. I wanted to make sure that they were the ones getting the job done. And so this time, the plan was to go a bit more left. I figured the uh, they end up uh, consistently uh, going and lining up at the edge of that river, so maybe they would be able to get a shot. I did end up overlooking one thing, though, and that is those tiles uh, to the left. Um, there is a one uh, one kind of uh, vertical leap <laughs> towards the left there where Vice is, so they can't exactly be pushed in that direction, and additionally, it is very difficult to actually push them back once you get far enough. Uh, the main way to get this done is literally just going straight down the middle and making sure that everything is dead along the way. So to that end, uh, I decided to, uh, to make one very tanky knight here, um, and he was just going to sit here healing. Uh, this was... Uh, there's actually one section I cut out of that previous one where I actually had tried to kill the cleric in order to uh, to make it so that we could move more units slightly more to the right, <laughs> but it didn't end up actually doing anything, uh, which was a little bit disappointing because that would have been a uh, interesting story to start off on. It's like, so how did he manage to win that fight? Well, you see, we choked out our own priest, and that let us take one step that way. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, no, uh, it wasn't really going to be too much of a thing here. So started uh, started pushing that knight down there, and unfortunately, that was exactly what ended up screwing this particular attempt. See, I was trying to use that knight uh, to uh, to try and push down that way in order to hopefully uh, kind of bypass the units that were up there. Again, he needed to be one tile over, so I didn't really have any way to effectively push him backwards, so I figured maybe if we ensure that Donalto dies, which without assistance he almost certainly will, maybe he could get uh, kind of accidentally knocked backwards uh, onto the main path, right? So it seemed like a solid idea at the time, however, he didn't end up living long enough to actually realize that. Uh, remember that actually reviving a unit in this particular uh, rule set here is going to be exceptionally difficult, just due to the fact that we can't actually reach them within any reasonable amount of time. Uh, the only time that this will effectively change is in Chapter 4. Uh, once we get access to Resurrection and a 5 range staff, then we might be able to do something, and even then, uh, it's actually one of the reasons that I plan to go Lord on this particular run. Um, just because a combination of uh, Extend, uh, Conserve MP, Conserve RT, uh, and uh, that, uh, that 5 range staff would be the only way to effectively manage to uh, to re-raise units in some of the uh, rougher kind of neighborhoods of this game. So <laughs> that's, uh, th that's a story for another time. Now you might notice we are 17 minutes in, and we have not even cleared uh, Chrysero yet. Uh, that is why this run is going to be a very long one. Um, however, things will speed up past Chapter 1, as they generally tend to do. So at this point, uh, yeah, our night guy ended up uh, getting knocked down, uh, he ended up bleeding out, and now we were left with, uh, with Canopus, who we were getting over there, who again, stupidly ran into the exact same issue, where he has no way to actually get down there. Um, so I was trying to test out the ranges to see if there was any way to kind of awkwardly nudge anyone else in that direction, but it became very quickly clear that this was just not going to happen on that particular attempt. So just go ahead and we, we might as well just skip to the end of this attempt. It goes nowhere. <laughs> so I keep awkwardly trying to just shuffle units around, and here we go. This is the one that actually managed to pull it off. So I move those two guys over to the center. We get the archers off to the back, one cleric off to the side, specifically... The, uh, the reason that they're going for these particular spots is a is a shuffle that'll be required partway through. So we have the guys in the back for obvious archer-related reasons. There was one thing that I forgot, which was to switch the dagger guy out for a buckler. Um, it still was fine. He ended up getting that knockback chance with his dagger. He still had a way to knock somebody backwards, so it's good enough. Um, and I'm thinking down the road, longbow plus, uh, a plus fist might be able to get the job done too. But for the time being, it was fine. Um, I feel like the fist has a higher knockback chance than the throwing rock, but I'm really not sure. Anyway, so the particular shuffle that we were going for here uh, was to use shields to bash the first few units forward, and then essentially use the additional range as well as the short range of the short bow uh, to awkwardly uh, shuffle them forward very slightly, one tile at a time. Uh, this would allow uh, Canopus and our knight uh, to be uh, to be shoved forward over and over and over, uh, pushing themselves through that gap. Uh, the other soldiers would hopefully be taken out uh, along the way, um, but they do get very close to uh, taking out our uh, AI buddies here. Um, now, again, they're not necessarily, they're not strictly necessary, but honestly, 
it just ends up being a smoother run with them there. Uh, and frankly, it's taking the extra time to kill everybody off between these different things would just not be worthwhile considering this is chapter one anyway, and yeah, it is what it is. So, uh, so anyways, Kashua ends up uh, blocking off that soldier over there, and the uh, we get our uh, two uh, main heavy hitters that are going forward. I, I mean, I say heavy hitters, that knight can basically not hurt anyone, but he is uh, going to be healing. So we've got healing coming from the knight, we've got healing coming from Denim, who is currently a shortbow rune fencer at this point, um, and we're going to have uh, Canopus, who's going to be our main damage dealer uh, over the course of the fight. Um, there were a few tricks that were discovered here. Uh, for one thing, the AI will actually generally avoid uh, going into contact with the uh, the enemy leader here uh, if you uh, if you give them any reason to stay here whatsoever, uh, with the exception to Vice, who will occasionally try to take a shot with a shortbow, which is why I gave him one of those. It's the in that particular respect, uh, shortbow Vice is still as good as he was in PSP. Now, uh, with uh, with all of that being said. We have to kill off all of the other units here in order to actually stand a chance of getting through the middle anyway. Uh, if they end up taking a uh, critical from the wrong side, or just a passive knockback from the wrong side, uh, they would end up having a really bad time. This is why that knight was left there, this is why Canopus was left up top, um, because we want to actually clear the road before we uh, before we end up doing anything. And additionally, there was an extremely rare chance here to actually pick up a stat card on somebody. It wasn't a very useful stat card, but dang it, there was an opportunity to do so, so we were going to do it. Um, so, all right, so we end up uh, getting our agility bonus <laughs> from that card that was there. I know, it's it's amazing. Who would have thought? At, at, at one whole agility point, it is crazy what technology can do these days. Um, anyway, uh, so to that, uh, to that particular end, and also I'm going to turn up the volume very slightly here because I feel like it's maybe slightly off. I don't know. I'm going to find out later. I'm basically going to find out after the fact whether the volume sucked the entire time, and it's just quietly non-musical in the background, or if there was something, you know, way too loud and now the talking can't be heard. I don't know. These bars are not very useful for this. Uh, anyway, so, with that said, let's continue on. So, so as it stands, now that everything is mostly clear, we can start getting our dudes forward. Uh, the knight goes forward first, he gets tucked in between the houses in order to make sure that he can't get shoved side to side. Uh, next will be uh, Canopus, so we're taking it a bit more carefully with him, uh, making sure that we have healing all the way across the way. Uh, because if he gets out of healing range, he can very quickly end up dying. Uh, yes, even at this stage of the game here. So the thing is, uh, having having access to a lot of uh, redundant healers is going to become very, very important, um, as well as a lot of AWEs. Uh, for very obvious reasons, in order to have complete control over anything, we are going to have to consistently just kind of keep a bunch of bubbles going on throughout the map. So while our leader back here, or sorry, our healer back here can do her job relatively well, uh, she can only be in that particular area. This is why we're always going to be running potentially two or three clerics, depending on the situation. Now, just Vice getting through on his own doesn't really do very much here. He'll, uh, he ends up uh, getting taken out before he can actually do anything useful whatsoever on the other side, uh, simply because suck moves actually cause a very slight delay in their actions, um, so he'll end up uh, effectively uh, getting killed before he, again, does anything meaningful. He takes one shot, um, he he takes a very slight delay while being over there. Um, if I recall, am I remembering that wrong? Because I remembered him being just, yeah, he is just slightly behind her. I think all the other ones ended up lining up their turns a little bit better this time around. Either way, honestly, whether there was that delay or not probably wouldn't have made much of a difference. She can still two-shot him, no questions asked, uh, because, I mean, he, he basically has no resistance, so it is what it is. So, uh, yeah, goodbye to, uh, to Vice. Uh, you will not necessarily be missed, but thank you for at least sort of scratching the boss a little bit. Now, this left us in a situation where we're out of range to actually move those two forward. Our short bows are not going uh, far enough, and while Denim can get the job done, he currently is not doing a very solid job of it. If, even though I can push him one tile forward, um, that would potentially cause him to be unable to move those two up there. Additionally, Mr. Oliver over here is going to be our main guy that can actually get some movement done, um, but unfortunately, as it stands, uh, in order to get him to move forward at all, we have to land a uh, kind of natural knockback crit uh, with our dagger guy because he's the only one that I forgot to get to put a shield on. Which is fine. Again, it's still technically doable. It's fine. Um, but again, we use our uh, little uh, redundant healing bubble up here to just kind of stall for time until we can make that happen. 
But then another idea came to mind, because while we can't necessarily move the other ones forward yet, uh, they've got very short-range weapons, so it's not necessarily going to be enough even by itself, two plans were kind of coming to mind. On the one end, uh, we had the option to throw Kashua forward uh, to see if she might uh, eventually get a bit more aggro to the boss, and additionally, we can keep throwing rocks at Rosalind over here so that she can get an awkward shot on one of her buddies uh, so that uh, she could uh, then throw him forward to get a better shot on her frontliners. Um, this, both of those end up actually being functional. So, unfortunately, uh, Canopus decides to keep blocking here. Kashua gets the last of the exorcism done. And finally, if this ends up being the right uh, round, I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. This was, I think this was when uh, Kashua was shield bashed uh, into, the, uh, into the front line there. I don't know. I, I, also, I figure it's a given at this point. Uh, there's no world being used for the purposes of this run. I would kind of defeat the entire purpose. Uh, funnily enough, I think I saw a comment in broken English earlier today saying that the only way that, uh, uh, that Leonard could be beaten in the dual setting was through using world, and clearly the video was cheated. Like, like here it is. Here's another video of being done with every single damn class. What do you want, man? <laughs> but anyway... All right, let's go ahead and uh, continue on here. So, with Kashua being thrown forward, as long as she makes it past that little jump-down area, uh, she actually will uh, will end up getting a bit uh, aggressive towards the boss here. So, boss ends up going forward. She sees an opportunity to go use her missiles. Uh, for those that have never done it, by the way, uh, she can use Spirit Surge. Uh, I don't think she comes with it naturally. I think I pop that on her. But, uh, yeah, she... Part of the whole thing with her class is that she can use offensive spells while being a uh, you know support character and all of that. Um, uh, so you know that's that's a bit of a thing. Uh, so yeah, she can hit them at long range if you give her a spirit surge, but uh, it's not necessarily that useful. She's still going to lose a one v one versus the necromancer one way or another. Even though on paper she actually does come in with a bit of an advantage, she does have a level disadvantage. But uh, she also does not uh, d does not come in as divine, so she doesn't take any additional punishment from her spells. So she is uh, more so neutral than actually resistant. But eh, it's fine. Uh, frankly, uh, Moldova is uh, is generally strong enough that it doesn't really that it doesn't really make that much of a difference. But at least she puts a dent uh, dent on her, so it's something. Um, it still, again, won't be how the fight ends up uh, ending. But it's nice that uh, it's nice that she's trying. It's nice that she's participating. So finally, that throwing rock gets that knockback, uh, which allows us to free up Oliver, which allows us to move the knight. Um, basically, this is going to be one long game of traffic jam, and uh, you know what? I'm okay with that. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, this is cozy. I, I know this all seems very tedious. I know it seems like it's a gigantic pain in the ass. I could be hamming it up like, oh my god, this has sucked so much, you guys. It was crazy and totally impossible how anyone could ever do this ever, but... I legitimately enjoy these kinds of challenges, so, uh, you know. <laughs> so it is what it is. I really like these, uh, these kind of awkward ones, and finally this weird recording method let me, uh, uh let me have an excuse to, uh, to play this, uh, kind of janky way here, in a way that doesn't involve streams that I have neither the, uh, the time nor setup to do right now. So, uh, anyway... All right, so with all those extra movements now under our belts, uh, we're able to uh, to move uh, Canopus up to his absolutely maximum development range here. He can reach a absolutely massive halfway across the map. He literally can go no further outside of being thrown into the water. Um, so yeah, that's his, that's his best range. Thankfully, it is just barely within range. Uh, that uh, she doesn't quite want to step onto the bridge to expose herself, um, but he can technically take a just out of range shot um, because the AI loves to stay just out of range of your bows and things. <laughs> so either way, um, we can go ahead and abuse that uh, firing beyond range mechanic uh, to make sure that she turns up dead. That took a very long time. Um, that took several hours <laughs> to actually get there. Uh, it took a couple days of uh, different attempts uh, and all of that, but uh, either way, eventually got there. Getting sleep from that particular thing is absolutely fair. Uh, we end up getting that uh, light charm off of uh, accidentally picking up a buff card. Um, I mentioned that this is kind of, sort of, kind of a... Uh, the evolution of the Nothing Burger idea, and really, the point of Nothing Burger wasn't necessarily just about, like, oh my god, these cards are so overpowered, you guys, from the early reviews and crap like that. 
it was more so just a, like, here you go. You've, like, no grinding, no nothing, like, absolute bottom of the barrel, whatever you can do kind of situation is still just fine. And then, honestly, in my mind, the speed run basically already showed that. Like, you can be minimum everything, almost never visiting the store, and still be just fine if, you, like, if you're paying attention to mechanics in this game. Um, so, either way. It is what it is, and we now have one very unfortunate thing that ends up happening, in which we end up getting Felicia. Now, here's the thing. With Felicia, like, the, what the game decided, more or less, here at this point, was the fact that, yes, you would get a replacement cleric if your primary cleric died in that fight. Um, back in the SNES version, there was a non-zero chance that your own personal cleric uh, would not exist by this point, and this would be your first cleric, and if they got killed, they gave you a replacement one, just to make sure that you actually had one. You came in with just basic soldiers, and they would remain basic soldiers probably until Chapter 2. At which point, uh, you would have no idea what caused them to promote at the time. <laughs> it was... Man. The SNES game tried so hard, but there were so many things that were so weird about it. Um, anyway, uh, the problem with Felicia in Reborn is just that her voice is one of those standouts of, like, good lord. <laughs> Why? Um, for some reason, she just talks in third person like a cat person. I don't know. I don't understand that whatsoever, but... I guess they just assumed you had to be on a challenge run uh, and needed a meme character if uh, if you were to encounter her in the first place, which, fair, I guess. Um, it's just, if she ends up accidentally getting thrown off a cliff, don't blame me, that was just fate. Um, so I start going over what's actually available to us. Uh, obviously, we don't have our second uh, shop upgrade yet. I was considering going to do Nybeth right now, uh, but without overheads, it's... Uh... It's not that it's impossible, but I wasn't about to spend the next, like, you know, three weeks trying to, uh, to puzzle that crap out when there was more interesting stuff to do. So, I went ahead over to uh, Gold Boar's A Plane there and started putzing around with a few different ideas. Uh, for one thing, I tried to implement the, uh, the one weapon that never works out in any of these uh, runs whatsoever, and that is putting a stone bow on Canopus, objectively the worst frickin' weapon in this game. Like, as far as I'm concerned, ever. Sure, there's weapons with lower stats. There's uh, weapons with lower ranges, but, like, that thing is uniquely shitty. <laughs> like, not only does it take two hands as opposed to the one from the bow gun, it basically gets almost no damage bonus from it. Um, it is resisted by, uh, by early game armors, so you don't see any of its additional damage bonus. It has just as short of a range as the dang short bow, actually shorter than the short bow. Um takes a completely different skill to use. I mean, the, the bow gun at least gets a shield with it, uh, so it, it isn't really unlocking anything new. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it, I th the only thing I can think of, again, as to why the stone bow is so shitty um, is, again, because of its kind of unique position in terms of using crushing as opposed to uh, physical damage. And while on the player side, typically uh, you're not going to be seeing that damage bonus apply very much, considering everyone's running leather, I assume everybody's got a better crushing bonus, and that's why you see almost no extra from that stone bow whatsoever. It's not a massive deal by any means. It's a weapon that becomes obsolete almost immediately as you get it. I just always keep trying to use it and always end up getting disappointed by it. The only reason it's doing damage right now is because it's Kenobis doing it. Um, like, it's useful on him. It's useful as a funny meme, like, hey, my crossbow shoots rocks kind of thing. But, like, yeah, it's just... <laughs> it's a bad weapon by design, but it's still just a bad weapon. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so, yeah. Just ignore the fact that he does more damage than everybody else on the team right now. That is just Canopus being Canopus at this stage of the game. He comes in basically at a uh, hidden level advantage, more or less, courtesy of his stats. Um, he, I, I forget what his stat bonus was across the board. It ends up evening out over time, but obviously he's meant to be your, you know, your veteran guy that's leading everybody to to victory and what have you. Um, and yeah, he does that job pretty well. Um, Funnily enough, as far as bonuses go, that's one of those things I liked about Reborn, that 
pretty much everything you can point to as being an obvious, like, this makes sense for the time kind of thing. Like, while you have your, your veteran guy, they end up completely evening out with everybody else over time in a very smooth manner to the point that many folks assume that the Vartan class itself drops off. Um, whereas the class itself is fantastic, it's just that uh, his stat bonus is no longer as uh, noticeable as it was before. Technically, any Hawkman can become Vartan. Um, it's an unusual class, it's not a, uh, not a unique class. Um, it's funny because uh, if you uh, if you take a little bit of extra time during one of the fights in Chapter 1, you can get a bunch of uh, generic Vartans if you want to. It's just that that situation doesn't come up for most, so <laughs> most assume that it's, uh, it's just a uh, completely unique class to them, which is just kind of funny to see. Um... Like how even when I made the uh, the Vartan uh, Know Your Yuna video, there were uh, there were folks insisting that uh, that he was completely unique, and I was just an idiot. Oh well. Anyway, moving on. So we start noticing one little observation here, uh, which is that spears are going to become a mainstay in this run. See, the short bow and shield setup that I like using in, in uh, the beginning here is mostly just for convenience. Um, it won't really necessarily come back until much later. Uh, but uh, but when it comes to shortbow and shield, it works for this situation exclusively just because, uh, well, it gives an additional range. Um, we're actually going to be using uh, fencers with spears more often than not, just because it gives us access to counterattack, and additionally uh, also will give us that uh, long range, not to mention once we get up to chapter 3, uh, the, uh, the long range uh, lightning AOE will be very, very useful. Um, but basically, it's a lot of things that this run needs in one convenient package. And then finally, we actually wrapped it up right here. I didn't want to uh, to make this too long of a first episode, so we ended up uh, wrapping it up about right here. Um, just uh, finally uh, finally deciding that we're going to abandon Sistina immediately. If she survives, she survives, but realistically, we are not getting there in any length of uh, reasonable time whatsoever. So anyways, I hope you all had fun with this concept. I'm looking forward to doing more of them, and... Um, yeah, that's kind of about that. So, y'all have yourselves a good one, take care, and I will see you in the next one, and why are we back here? What happened with that? Huh. You know what? I think a few of these got out of order. That's, a. Uh, that does explain why there was that sudden jump, huh? Okay, you know what? Actually, no. We're not done here. We're gonna continue talking through this fight, dang it. Um, that's weird. That is super weird that I decided to play these after. What the hell is the deal with that? Huh. Alright, so, recording method isn't perfect. It is what it is. Um, anyway, so, ultimately, yeah, what ended up happening during that fight? We time-traveled, apparently. What the hell? Okay, you know what? Screw it. We are done at that point. Uh, Bol or, uh, Brezen obviously ended up getting close, and then we shot him a whole bunch, uh, courtesy of being able to shield Bash Canopus onto a Fizz Up card, um, as well as dropping a Breach on him. But what the actual hell is going on with this... Uh... All right. I will figure this out later. Y'all have yourselves a good one, take care, and thank you for stopping by. Later.